Hey, it's 89.9 Cute FM. Oh, that is the jam, man. Well, listen, I told you I was going to have a guest on the show, and I am so excited to have this next guest. Not only is she my guest, she is my friend. She's my church sister. Yes. And now before we do anything, before I officially introduce Paula Williams, now, Paula, you picked that jam, man. T tell the listeners why you picked that jam. I picked that jam because I am an overcomer. And the words of that song really express what it means to be an overcomer. And so I call that my theme music. Well, that's what's up. And not only are you an overcomer, you're a DJ up in here. I am. <laughs> 89.9. Well, I, I am. I, I'm blessed to know that, you know, you take the time to come and talk to our listeners. Uh, and I don't take this lightly because uh, you, you are a survivor. You are an overcomer. You're a breast cancer a survivor. And you have a story. You have a journey uh, to share. You have a, a miracle healing journey That's it. Um, that 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 you would like to share and that I would like for you to share. Um, with our listeners. So with that said, I'm just going to say, um, take it away. And thank you for coming to 89.9. Well, thank you, Joyce, for having me. I count it an honor and a privilege to be here. And a few months ago, one of my mentors, she sent me an email mm -hmm. and it said, you had to go through something hard to help other people get through their something hard. And that's your personal brand. And shortly after that, she passed away right mm. in her sleep. And that's the last email that she sent me. So opportunities like this, I don't take it lightly. Sure. I take it as an opportunity to share what I went through that was hard to let everyone know that the same God that healed me can heal anyone. Oh, my goodness. And, and say, tell that statement again that she sent you. You had to go through something hard to help other people get through their something hard. Oh, that is and profound. And for me breast cancer was my something hard. Now, when did you discover, um, and you describe it as something hard, something hard. some would say it, that's something devastating. Um, that's something life altering and, yes. and just your, your position of saying just something hard, yeah. uh, just yeah. something hard so that others can go through something hard. Right. When did you, um, when was it identified to you? Okay, so the end of 2019, I was getting my mammograms. I'm someone that gets their mammogram every single year. Okay. It's just a non-factor. Get the girls checked. Get, get the girls checked. And I went and I was particularly excited about this time around because they were using the 3D mammograms. Okay. So the 3D ones are supposed to pick up on more um, information. Yeah, it's just yeah. a big, the next big thing in mammograms. So I'm all excited and I get the 3D mammogram and then I get a letter in the mail a couple weeks later and the letter said we are pleased to inform you that your mammogram was fine okay no problems no issues and I'm like yes this is wonderful we're fine till next year right a couple weeks later I get a call from my OBGYN she remembered something that I had shared with her back in 2016 it was Father's Day. I was hanging out with my dad. We were on the deck and he told me something that he had never told me before, which was that his mother's name was Pauline. My real name is Pauline okay. and I'm Paula for short. His mother's name is Pauline. They were living in a country called Belize in Central America and she had breast cancer. They came all the way to the United States to get her the best treatment possible. She ended up losing her battle to breast cancer and she passed away mm -hmm. after that i was born and they named me after her okay. pauline okay. that gave me family history two days after he shared that story with me he passed away tragically in new york city oh i'm so sorry to hear that Paul. thank you mm -hmm. had he not told me that before mm -hmm. he died mm -hmm. i would not have known i did not feel a lump I did not discover anything on my own and that 3D mammogram said that I was fine. So thank God that that OBGYN, Dr. Um, Miller, mm -hmm. that she remembered that, mm -hmm. that she had it in my history. 
grandmother had breast cancer, who would have known from 2016 to 2021 that that would come into play? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that was the beginning. I listened to her. I went and got an ultrasound, mm -hmm. and the ultrasound showed some findings that were quote unquote suspicious. Mm -hmm. After that, I had to go in for a biopsy, and the biopsy revealed a tumor in my breast. Oh my goodness. So let's, let's just go back. And, mm -hmm. and so folks, if you're just tuning in, uh, it's breast cancer awareness yes. month. And, and as we all know, um, breast cancer doesn't just appear in October, you know, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a journey uh, that continues to happen throughout the year and joining us in the air chairs, Paula Washington, uh, and she's sharing her, her journey, yes. uh, her surviving journey. And so, so you had the 3d done and mm -hmm. everything was fine. Mm -hmm. But you also had a conversation to learn that there is uh, possibly some genetics in the family That's it. Uh, that has to do with cancer. And, and so how, how long after this 3D, and did you feel any way different, even though you got the findings to say that everything was fine, uh, did you feel anything different to say, let me now get checked out or, or there's a possibility of something being wrong? No. No, I was that's the scary part about it. Some people have dense breasts, especially in African American women, which one out of eight African American women is projected that they will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. So um So I, when you got the letter, so not to interrupt you, but but because you know, you're saying something now that really affects all African American women because right, we go, we get that um, mammogram, and we, we have the mammography, good. and then we get that letter yes. that says, because we all have that, we, we got the girls, yes. right? We have that muscleless fiber. Um, and so we get the letter to say that we have dense breasts and to go back for an ultrasound. Yes. And you followed all of those steps. I followed all of those steps. Mm -hmm. So I want to say it was just like a little over a month. And then the biopsy revealed a tumor and it showed exactly where it was, which was in the left breast. So at that point, knowing it was in the left breast, I touched it a little bit more than I normally would. Mm -hmm. And then I felt something that was a little concerning. And I said to my husband, do you feel that? And he said, oh, yes, I think I do. But we we're still waiting for the results. Okay. But we're just digging, digging, digging because mm -hmm. we knew that th potentially there could be something there. Okay. So um, I went and two of my friends were actually battling breast cancer, both of them under 40 years old. Mm -hmm. And they referred me to Dr. Camilla Lawrence. Okay. She is the head. I hear that yeah, you've interviewed yeah. her before. So you know Dr. her, our friend. Yeah, so Dr. Lawrence show. is the yes. head of uh, breast cancer surgery at the hospital of Central Connecticut. And um, I met with her and I'm thinking, I'm like looking at Robbie, I'm thinking it's going to be like, weeks before she could see me because mm -hmm. she's so popular. I called her office. They're like, we'll see you immediately. I went there. They did additional tests. You had to do, I had to do a biopsy where you're face down with your head in a cradle and a pole is going between your breasts mm -hmm. and you're on your knees and they push you in Oh my goodness! for an MRI. So that's capturing everything. Okay. I did that. I was in so much pain and I remember them saying, um, do you want to listen to music? I said, yes. And they said, what kind? And I said, gospel music. And they say, in particular artist, I said, JJ Harrison. Oh, yes. I went to high school at JJ Harrison. Okay. Yes, okay. I'm from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Okay. And Shout the, out to Bridgeport. Yes, Bridgeport. <laughs> and the song Thankful came on. And I remember just hearing his voice. And he's also a friend of mine. Thankful, mm -hmm. thankful. And I'm just like, I'm thankful to be alive. I'm thankful to be here. They put me in the machine. I couldn't move. They pulled me out. And a couple of days after that, they called and said, that didn't capture everything. We need you to come back and do that all over again. Oh my goodness. And I was crushed, mm -hmm. but I did it again, still having that expect expectancy that everything was going to be fine. Yeah. So I met with Dr. Lawrence in her office. She said that the tumor was 1.7 centimeters initially. Mm -hmm. After that second tumor, it was 2.5 centimeters. And then about a month after that, it's over five centimeters. So it was growing that quickly. It was quickly. growing that quickly. It's an aggressive tumor called HER2 positive. Okay. You have that kind of tumor, 
it's kind of like there's no time mm-hmm. to go in and do the surgery. Mm-hmm. You have to do chemo immediately. And the, the HER2, the, the HER2 positive um, tumor of the cancer. Yes. And and that particular cancer is, a, the particular cancer is an aggressive cancer That's in, it. as it relates to African-American women. Yeah. Um, and so so you're working with Dr. Camelia Lawrence. Yes. Uh, and you're finding things, things out in such a, quick amount of time so and things are changing so dramatically um, for you, Paula. Um, number one, what support system are you now going to first and foremost to keep your faith and keep your encouragement? Yeah. And folks, if you're just tuning in, I, I've got Paula Williams and we're just having a conversation. Uh, we're having a conversation that will hopefully save your life or save someone life that you know, yeah. uh, because we're talking about early detection and we're talking about detection and the importance of a mammography screening uh, and how breast cancer affects our community, particularly as it affects African American women. And and the challenge with this is that when it hits us, that when it's discovered, it's stage two or stage three or stage four, where it becomes really difficult to fight. Uh, and so this is the importance mm-hmm. of this screening. And so you went for this screening like like you do every year, checking the girls. Yeah. Uh, and so now you're at this point. So what support system are you looking to? And then how are you continuing um, your miracle healing journey? Okay, so my support system, first and foremost, came from my family. And um, this also I found interesting. The same day that I got the results, Mm -hmm. they ushered me into another room where I had immediately, I mean, you didn't have to, but I wanted to take a BRCA gene test. Okay. Because I wanted to make sure that I didn't have the gene for that. Sure. So that alone was scary as well and my daughter who's actually in the studio with us right now shout out to Trinity Trinity Williams in the house I wanted to make sure she was protected you know and that she didn't have to go through this and so um we waited I'm not sure how long a couple weeks and then we found out that I did not have the gene for that okay so that was good so we're ready we're in fight mode I'm building up my support system I am looking up particularly African-American women other people that fought this Mm -hmm. and I didn't see that many of them in terms of like shaving your head and things like that so I said I need people to pray Mm -hmm. I needed whoever my church family Mm -hmm. my work family my friends Mm -hmm. everybody to pray just pray for Paula Mm -hmm. and so because I did not see that many people documenting their journey in my initial searches I said you know what I'm going to capture this and I'm going to do it in real time and I'm going to put it out there on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, everything so that people could be along for my miracle healing journey. So you put yourself out there. I put myself out there. And when my husband shaved me bald, Trinity was recording over 5,700 people saw that in 24 hours. Oh my goodness. Because I wanted people to see. Like with me, with my hair, it was just falling out like cotton candy. Mm -hmm. I would just touch it and I would have clumps up here. I'm walking to the bathroom, there's hair. In the sink, there's hair. And I didn't want to go through that over and over again because every single time it was upsetting. So I said, you know what, let's just shave it. And my husband, Rich, is a two-time kidney cancer survivor so this has hit our family before Mm -hmm. and um after he shaved me bald Mm -hmm. he gave me the clippers Mm -hmm. and let me shave him bald to let me know that i'm not alone and he took the hair and put it in a big heart and had me stand in the heart to show that i was loved what a blessing so i was like all these people that are watching, these are the people that I need to pray. These, This is my support system. Mm-hmm. And my friends rallied around me. And there was another person in our church who I won't say her name on the radio, but she was also battling a different form of cancer. And two people, Larley Alvarenga, followed by Racina Reynolds, Mm -hmm. I'm sure you you may know her, they got together and they formed what's called an encouragement parade where they sent out letters, um, flyers. I didn't know anything about this. And they shut down my street and came all the way down car after car after car. They had decorated a table for me outside. And there was a big basket there where people were just dropping off cards gift cards, grocery cards, you name it. And they were just beeping their horns saying, you got this we love you you can do this fight 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 and all of them are holding up signs and i'm just like so emotional and just so grateful for everybody so there was a police escort 
-hmm. And not only did they go to my house, they then went to the other person who was battling cancer. So, so folks, if you're just tuning in, I've got Paula Williams in the air chair and mm -hmm. we're having a conversation and really it's full transparency, right? I mean, you, you are sharing uh, your story as it relates to breast cancer and being a breast cancer survivor. Uh, and the things that you were going through mentally, physically, emotionally, and now having this support system. Yeah. And, 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 you know, they say that even just by telling a story, by sharing your story, by opening up to others, it's healing. Not only is it healing for you, but it's healing for our listeners. And that is my hope uh, in today and having you in the air chair. And so as you discovered your, your journey mm -hmm. with cancer, with breast cancer and now you have this support system in place and i know a lot of folks will say well wow i don't have that kind of support system but you didn't keep this to yourself okay. uh, you opened up about it you went on social media about it you you went rogue <laughs> and yeah. some folks will say that you know they may not do that but through this all what has um, helped you the most where are you now in your journey okay. and and what would you like our listeners to know okay after building up the support system um and people praying for me and feeling the prayers at that point i was going through chemotherapy so i did go completely bald i lost some nails i was sick as a dog and i went from chemotherapy to then immunotherapy so i went to the cancer center which is over a, about 40 minutes from my house every three weeks for 13 months so it wasn't like a quick thing. It mm -hmm. was a long mm -hmm. thing. And I remember ringing the bell and being so excited that I rung the bell because I had finished chemo. And then he's like, ah, oh, you're not completely done yet because you get a port in your chest. So I okay. thought they could just take out this port. And he's like, you know, I have to go through immunotherapy to build back up your immune system. After that, mm -hmm. it was time for the mastectomy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I been following different support groups on Facebook. They're out there. You could just Google their support groups by Connecticut, by um, African American, you name it. Mm -hmm. Breast Cancer Baddies, Sisters Journey, which is local in um, New Haven. And I remember writing, what is a DMX? Because people were saying, I'm having a DMX. I'm having a DMX. I'm having a DMX. I only know the rapper DMX. Right, right. No idea what a DMX was. A DMX. And then somebody wrote, a DMX is when you have a double mastectomy and both of your breasts removed. Okay. So I was thinking about that because I don't judge anybody for me. And I met with a plastic surgeon. I did lots of different resources. And I decided that I wanted to be flat happy and healed flat happy and healed yes okay, and okay. dr lawrence actually co-wrote a book called flat and happy okay and i was reading that book too but prior to that because i was given that after sure. i just decided that if i needed one removed which i did because it was so aggressive that i just wanted both of them removed so i had surgery okay went in for the surgery dr lawrence did it at the hospital that she works at mm -hmm. um she had her whole team i asked her if we could pray before the surgery she said yes we prayed i went up for surgery and you know how sometimes they tell you to count backwards or say your abcs or something before you go under mm -hmm. she was saying my name and my date of birth and they she said her medical id which is a long number like over 12 digits over 10 digits i started rent saying that number okay. and she started laughing she said she's never had anybody do it i memorized that because every time i got chemotherapy they would read off that number okay and the day after chemotherapy my husband would have to stick me with a needle in my stomach mm -hmm. that would give me bone pain pain from the crown of my head all the mm. way down where I was bedridden from seven to nine days mm. where all I could do is lay straight, stare at the ceiling and just call on Jesus. I had nothing, no taste. I could not, you know, even I even had to drink a special water that um, people would drop off at my house okay. because your taste buds are shot. Your energy is shot. I worked with a health coach, Mary Taylor, okay. who would come to the house and juice things for me. So we have the surgery, both breasts are cut off mm -hmm. and I went home the next day. Okay. Some people, I guess back in the day, years ago, you're laid up in the hospital for like, when I found out I was going home the next day, I was like, are you kidding me? But they're like, you're going home the next day. Went home the next day, 
you leave with drains that go into a bulb where the, the blood is just trickling down from the surgery to get everything out of your system. And um, I'm home for three days. Everything's fine, as fine as can be. I'm still in the bed, not really moving, need the assistance to go to the bathroom and all of that. And at one moment, I felt like something wasn't right. Okay. Something just felt weird, off. I remember calling for Trinity. And I said, Trinity, call daddy. At that point, everything, all I saw were gray circles. I had this ringing in my ear. I'm sweating. I'm feeling lightheaded. And by the time he comes into the room, he said my eyes were rolling in the back of my head. Oh my there was just no energy. He puts on my um, nightgown. It's a Saturday. It's raining. He's trying to get in touch with Dr. Lawrence. He's not sure what to do because, again, her hospital's all the way in New Britain. We live in Windsor. He brings me to Hartford Hospital. Okay. He gets in touch with her, and she said, I'll be there in 45 minutes. Okay. She comes all the way to a hospital she does not even work at. Her team was not there. All the people that were laughing and joking and, you know, Dr. Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence, she's in a hospital that's pretty much unfamiliar to her. Mm -hmm. She uh, opens me back up and she finds a one liter hematoma that was mm. crushing my chest. Almost died. I mean, could have died because if I didn't get there soon enough, mm -hmm. she pulls that out. Now I'm in the hospital for about five days in a totally different hospital. And we're doing this during COVID still, right? So people, I can't have my girlfriends come over, my family come over. My mother was trying to come from Bridgeport up and no one can come around me, okay? At the hospital, we were there. It, I remember it being Father's Day and I found a way to get my husband in, but really the visitors were like on lockdown. Mm -hmm. And so two weeks later, I go to meet with Dr. Lawrence so she could check the scars and the stitches and everything that's going on. I still have these drains hanging down from me. And while she's examining me, which I didn't even know how I would have the energy to go see her, mm -hmm. she said, before the surgery, they cut under my left arm and they took 12 lymph nodes out and they sent them to the pathology lab. Now, all this time, all these tests have taken weeks, days for results to come. Something because she's just telling me that to tell me that, mm -hmm. not that she would actually have the results. Mm -hmm. And she said, I have the results. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, okay, please let it be good. Let it be good. Because you don't want to end the lymph nodes to spread to your body. Okay. And she said, the results of the lymph nodes showed that they were all benign. All 12 of them oh, were benign. They God. did not spread. So I'm like, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. But still, I'm still weak and I'm still frail and I'm laying on her table and she's just talking and I'm trying to pay attention. And then I don't know what made me ask this because I never in a million years would have thought two weeks later she would have the results of the breasts. Okay. And I said, what about the breasts? She said, we sent those to the pathology lab as well. And the breast results came back. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Because I was supposed to finish chemo, do immunotherapy, then do radiation, which is five days a week. Endless until they tell you to stop. She said she had the results of both breasts from the pathology lab. And it showed that I'm something called, and I want your viewers, your listeners to really, really pay attention to this. Because this is an acronym that has changed my life. She said, you are what we call N. E-D. N-E-D. And N-E-D stands for no evidence of disease. Oh, praise God. Oh, no my goodness. No cancer. The tumor is gone. And I'm just like, thank you, God. All those prayers that went up, mm -hmm. the healing was coming mm -hmm. down. And then my husband says, what about the radiation? Because okay. that was next. It was surgery, chemo with immunotherapy, and then mm -hmm. radiation five days a week for until... It's deemed that I could stop. And she said, you don't need radiation. Oh, what a blessing. And then I'm like, and then mammograms, I never need another mammogram okay. because I have no breasts. Okay. And so I just want your listeners to know that the same God that healed me can heal anyone from anything because this was my something hard. And so many people have reached out to me, like you said. So now we're 
all over. Mm -hmm. So people from North Carolina, people from the Bahamas, people have, were reaching out to me saying, I want to cut my hair, but I'm scared. And I, but I saw your video and I'm inspired, mm -hmm. you know? And so I just kept sharing. Um, I shared what to bring to chemo. This is how I feel after I get the shot. This is, it's all out there under Paula M. Williams on YouTube. And again, back to the village, just the people that know will be there for you. What what a a what a journey. What a healing journey. Paula Williams, thank you. I I you know I I'm I don't even know what to say. <laughs> you are a lot. walking testimony. You certainly are and to just hear your journey uh and your transparency of all that you've gone through uh as it relates to this breast cancer yeah. uh and then where you are now. Uh, the, the the transformation that has happened in your life and, and to be able to share this journey with so many survivors and you yeah. are a survivor. And that is that is something that we don't want to overlook as we talk about breast cancer. There are over 3 million women walking around with um, ha having been diagnosed with cancer, but they're yeah. thriving. Yeah. Uh, they're thriving now in their life and you are thriving. You've gone through a journey but as they say, thank God I don't look like what I've been no. through. And what I've been through is not going to be a secret to anybody no. because I want other folks to get through uh, what I've gone through. Right. Uh, so it's 89.9 Cute FM. And we're just, we're having a conversation. We're having a, a, a healthy, informative, yep. educational conversation. Uh, about breast cancer, about the the importance of uh, mammography screening. And one of the most important things too is that uh, here in the state, you know, they often say, well, at the age of 40 uh, to get your mammogram, but you can get a baseline mammogram from the age of 35 right. um, just to have something to work with. And so I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming in and sharing all of this with our listeners how can people contact you if and if you're so comfortable with sharing that yeah. uh to, to just if, if they want to contact you if they want to uh, get some information inspiration from you or just maybe they have a question yeah. uh, that they want to ask you uh, because either they're going through it or they have a family member uh, that's going through this and then um and then i'm just going to pass it over to you share that information if you've got uh, anything else that you want to share that I did not ask you uh, that you'd like our listeners to know. And then we're going to jump back into some music. Okay. Uh, and I need for you to pick a jam uh, for our listeners for their ride home. So take it away. Okay. So you can find me under Paula M. as in Marie, Paula from Pauline Marie. So Paula M. Williams on YouTube. Paula Williams on Facebook and Instagram. You can leave a comment on my YouTube videos and I respond to all my comments. Or you can send me a message through Messenger on Facebook or um, Instagram. My pages are public. Um, I just want to thank um, my health coach that I mentioned earlier, Mary Taylor, and also a nonprofit called Gardner's House that's right on Albany Avenue in Hartford, Connecticut. I went into Gardner's House and Maggie Gardner let me know that I was not alone. She gave me a pink bag that had everything that I needed to bring to the hospital down to the soap. Mm. And so um, that's another resource and it's free. Again, she's right on Albany Ave. You walk in, you could Google Gardner's House. She's another resource and she has a Zoom every other Monday night for cancer survivors or people that are caregivers. And so um, there you have it. Uh, my jam yes. <laughs> is Won't He Do It by Corinne Hawthorne. I saw her once when she was opening for Kirk Franklin and she reached out her hand to me and I reached back and she sung while she was holding my hand. And the words to the song have got me through because it's God's grace. And it says people will wonder how you sleep at night. I even wonder how I sleep at night, even with the lingering side effects. I have lymphedema, I have neuropathy in my hands and my feet, but I'm here and I'm persevering. And I'm transparently sharing my something hard to help all of you listeners get through what you have to go through. That is hard. Won't he do it? Yes, he will.